Thank you, Sanchez, for that narration. It's wonderful. Hey, everybody. My name is Daniel Indrajaya. I'm one of the pastors here at church. It's such a pleasure. It's such an honor for us to, to have all of you here worshiping God with us. Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian novelist who later became a Christian because he came across the teaching of Jesus, especially from the Sermon on the Mount, he wrote this, Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. I think he's exaggerating a little bit there, but I have to agree with what he said. And I put it and paraphrase it this way, we can't grow if we won't change. We can't grow if we won't change. Your family can't grow if you won't change. Your marriage can't grow if you won't change. Your business cannot grow if you won't change. Your health will not grow, will not get better if you won't change. And similarly, your church will not grow if you won't change. That's why we are doing this series that we are calling We Can't Stay Here. As a church, we've been so blessed. We have so many ministry. People have been blessed through our ministry. And in a few months' time, we will move to our new facility, which is very, very exciting for all of us. For those of you who are visiting, you don't know. We're building a building that is quite nice, and we are so excited about that. But the danger of where we are right now is that we are at the intersection. We can get complacent. We can very easily get comfortable right now. And we say to ourselves, that's it. We made it as a church. We are happy where we are. I'm telling you, that cannot happen in our church. We can't stay here. Our mission is too important for us to remain the same. If you want to grow, you have to change. See, if you're not willing to change, not only will you not grow, but I'm afraid you will soon wither and die. Last week, Pastor Mike told us that an empty seat is a serious matter. And that's very true. An empty seat is a serious matter. You know why? Because every empty seat represents a person that could have sit there. And that person could have heard the message of the gospel that God loves them so much. That God is like this crazy hound who pursues them. And God wants to tell them that God loves them so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross so that they could have relationship again with their creator God. That's why every empty seed is precious to God because that represents a soul that Jesus died for. So uh, if you, on your way out, on your way out last week, you would have received this. Uh, it says an empty seed is a serious matter. This seed is reserved for. Um, I want you to take this seriously. I want your heart to break every time you see an empty seat next to you or somewhere nearby you, because that seat should have been filled with people who can hear the powerful message of the gospel. And as a way of reminder, you can use this tool to pray for someone, to remind yourself to, to actually extend yourself and make a space available through dinner, through coffee, through relationship, invest your life into their lives, and when the opportunity comes, invite them to come to church because that person, that friend of yours, that family member of yours is very, very precious to our God. Today, I'm calling my message, We Church, Not Me Church. We Church, Not Me Church. Turn to your neighbor and say, The Rocks is a we church, not a me church. Can you do that? Just nudge them. The Rocks is a we church, not a me church. You know, the world... It's full of selfish people all around us. You see selfish people everywhere. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, church, that can be us. We can be one of those selfish people. And we have to be careful not to turn our church into a consumer church. We are not a club whose mission is just to make you happy, but we are here to serve you, to help you to grow so that you, because of your growth in your relationship with God, can in turn bless other people. That's why we're here. That's why I want you to listen to what God has to say to you today. And I'm sure, I'm sure that God can turn every single one of you 
into a blessing. Would you like that? Do you want your life to be a blessing to others? Would you like your church, this church, to be a blessing for the community around us? I'm sure that's what you want. Uh, but I, I'm, I have to say, I find it really interesting that the more uh, a Christian claim to be mature, sometimes, not always, sometimes, it is actually those uh, supposedly mature Christians who are actually more selfish. You know, they come to church with the expectation that the church needs to serve them. That, hey, you know, the church needs to serve my family. The church needs to serve my kids. And so on and so forth. And I come, as long as the church continues to provide what I want, what I need, I will continue to come. And mostly, unfortunately, sometimes, this comes from those mature Christians. So we're here to change all that. We're here to declare to you today that we are not a me church. We are a we church. If you bring your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 3. And we're going to learn a very, very powerful story from this uh, short verses, 10 verses in the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. If you open your Bible toward the, the end of your Bible, you should be able to find the book of Acts or turn to your e Bible as well. Please, for the next half an hour, refrain from tweeting or using your Facebook or. Instagram or playing your game or so on, and at least pretend to hear me, all right? Here we go. Are you ready? Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At 3 in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Here's a bonus content for you. When you give God your attention, he will always exceed your expectation. One pastor said that. I think that's worth coming to church for. When you give God your attention, he will always exceed your expectation. Verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, the book of Acts is an amazing book. It is a historical account written by a medical doctor. His name was Luke. And Luke set out to write a historical accurate account of what happened to the early church. The early church who began meeting in a, in a small place in Jerusalem, uh, a few Jewish people who were really, really scared, you know, meeting in Jerusalem after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how this small group of Jewish people grew to Samaria. It grew to Turkey, to Ephesus. It grew to Italy, to Rome, and finally to the rest of of the world, and Luke wrote an accurate account of how this story came about. See, our God is all about expansion. He wants to expand His kingdom. He wants to expand His presence. He wants to expand His influence. He wants to expand uh, His love to all the world. You know why? Because every person in this world is precious in His sight. God loves them so much. As I told you already, if you're not a Christian and you're visiting today, this is the good news that we've been trying to tell people, those who want to hear us, that God is not an angry God, but He's a loving God. He loves us so much that He's willing to come down as one of us, became like man, even took on the form of a servant, the Bible says, and died on the cross, dying a criminal death. For what? For your sins and for my sins. See, if you're not a Christian, maybe you don't believe in this, but that's all right. But we at least acknowledge that we all made mistakes, correct? We at least made mistakes. You know, we all have some sort of moral standards that we have. Even we don't believe in any religion, we have like, yeah, this is right, this is wrong. And guess what? 
you even break your own moral standards, right? Sometimes you can't even keep what you think is right and wrong. Why is that? It's because of sin. Every one of us is sinful, the Bible says. No one is righteous. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. But God, instead of leaving us to our own devices, He instead came down, took on the form of a servant, and showed us, demonstrate to us how much He loves us. How many of you have seen the Home Shopping Network? You know, when you can't sleep at night, you flick through the channel, and you go through a, a Home Shopping Network, so you end up buying one of those nutri bullets that you don't really need, or that, man, that vacuum cleaner really sucks good, you know? It can suck this basketball. You know, I don't need a vacuum cleaner, but because the people, the marketing team, they, see, they take their cue from God. They're very smart. They say, they believe this, that demonstration is so much better than explanation, correct? Demonstration is so much better than explanation, and God knows that very well. Instead of just telling us, hey, people, I love you so much, God says, I'm going to come down. I'm going to die for them. I'm going to prove to them that I love them. That's why God is all about expansion. God wants to expand His kingdom. God wants to expand His presence, His purposes in this world. And that is why the church has to be about expansion as well. It is not a church if we are here just for us. It is a club. It's not a church if we're just here for our family. It's not a church if we are just here to be comfortable. It's not a church if it's a me church. It's only a church if it's a we church. Because God is about expanding His kingdom. God is about saving the world to Himself. You know, um, this is the bottom line. I'm just going to give it right to you at the beginning. For God's purposes to expand, we can't be a me church. We have to be a we church. That's the bottom line. For God's purposes to expand in this world, we can't be a me church. We have to be a we church. For God's purposes to expand, the church must be willing to expand. And for the church to expand, God's people must be willing to expand, to stretch. See, we can't be a selfish Christian. We got to watch our lives. We got to watch our prayers. See, selfish prayers make a selfish Christian. And we, when you get a bunch of selfish Christians together, you will get a selfish church. And a selfish church, let me tell you, cannot accomplish God's purposes in this world. Correct? Because that's why, as a church, we need to grow. We need to continue to expand. That's why there are people in this church who understand this. This is why we do what we do every week. This is why we're building a building. This is why some of you come here an hour earlier, two hours earlier to prepare. That is why some of our uh, dedicated kids ministry leaders, even though they go home, they're tired after a long day's work, they still prepare for the lesson for Saturday for the sake of your children. Why? Because they understand if we want to accomplish God's purposes in this world, we can't be a me church. We have to be a we church. We have to sacrifice. We have to stretch. We have to expand ourselves. Now, the book of Acts is all about a we church, not a me church. And today, from the passage that we just read, I want to just uh, make three observations of a we church. All right? Three observations and then we're done. Uh, let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Let's uh, leave that text on the screen. Here's my first observation. We church believes in partnership. We church believes in partnership. Notice the partnership that happened for the healing of this lame man to take place. All right. First, notice the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 3, one day... Peter and John. This is a key connection here. It is not just Peter. It is not just John. But it is Peter and John. See, even Jesus knew the power of partnership. When he sent his 12 apostles and 70 disciples, Jesus always sent them two by two. 
uh, Peter and John are often found together. They used to be business partners. They used to be fishermen together. They prepared the last Passover for Jesus together. They went to the tomb at the first Easter, the first resurrection uh, together. They ministered to the Samaritans who believed on Jesus Christ together. See, Peter and John, they were so different, but they needed each other. Peter had a type A personality. He was uh, a fast talker. You know, he's really good at, with talking. Have you ever met someone who's so good at talking? Sometimes they confuse you, but you think you're stupid, you know? Uh, but actually, they're just good at talking, right? That's Peter. He's good at talking, and he's very quick with his action as well. Remember when Jesus was about to be betrayed? He actually drew his sword and chopped off one of the ears of the guards. It was Peter who did that. He was a man of action. But John is totally different. John is very calm. He's cool, you know. And the Bible says he has such a tender heart. Jesus called him the disciple whom Jesus loved. When everyone abandoned Jesus, John was the only one at the foot of the cross waiting on Jesus. See, there were two different people, but they needed each other. You need somebody. You know, you need somebody to be your, on your other side of end. You know, when Peter and John came to the tomb at the Resurrection Sunday, uh, John was there first. But Peter came later, but he went straight into the tomb while John was waiting outside. See, he needed someone to be on the lookout. See, we needed each other. They were different, but we need each other. They all have their strength. You know, uh, John is a philosopher. If you read the Gospel of John, it's amazing. You know, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. What the heck does that mean? That was John, you know? He's a philosopher, right? He likes to think. He likes to pray. He likes to, you know, just commune with Jesus. But Peter didn't like any of that. He just, you know, bang, bang, bang. Thank you, ma'am. That's Peter. Now, but they needed each other because Peter has strength that John needs. See, if you leave the whole thing to John, nothing will get done, right? But Peter also needed John. You know when Peter denied Jesus three times? It could have been really, really bad for Peter. Did you know what happened to Judas, the other guy who betrayed Jesus? He felt so bad, he committed suicide. He was so depressed. That could easily have been Peter. And this is my theory. The only reason, my theory, not in the Bible, the only reason why Peter was in ministry in the first place I believe, was because of John's tender heart. It was John, more than any other disciples, who probably told Peter, hey, Peter, that's all right, man. It's okay. We can, you can do better. God has forgiven you. You can do it. Let's do this together. Let's continue to serve our Savior together. That's probably why they were so close to one another. You know, our strength as a church is in our differences. Amen? We need each other. We need to partner. There are things that only you can do that I cannot do. There are, only, there, are, there are people that only you can reach that I cannot reach. We need each other. You know, sometimes Christians have this tendency to actually judge other people and we want to make other people to be like us. So we become really mean to one another as a Christian. Those of you who like to pray long, you know, you accuse people who don't like to pray by saying, oh man, you know, you, you, this is the most important thing. You don't even pray. We don't know. We don't realize. Maybe these brothers, these sisters, they spend so many hours, like Peter, serving God in the background. Nobody even noticed. Nobody even cared. But they don't seek recognition. They just plug along. They just serve, 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 and serve. See, we can't judge others. We can't make others to be like us because our strength is in our differences. We need to partner together. Partnership is what we believe in a we church. Everyone say partnership. We need each other. Same thing. If you like to work, you can't accuse your brothers who, who like to pray long. You say, man, all you do is pray, pray, pray. Why don't you do something for a change? Man, we need prayer warriors in the church. Amen? I need people who pray for me. Otherwise, I can't do what I do without prayer. Our strength is in prayer. We needed each other. Peter needed John. John needed Peter. Paul needed Barnabas. Barnabas needed Paul. Mary needed Martha. Martha needed 
Mary. Shaq needed Kobe. Kobe needed Shaq. And Kanye needed Kim. We need each other. That's the point, all right? Not sure about the last one, but yeah. Can scratch that from the podcast. So, um, we need you in this church. We do. It's not just, I'm not just saying it to make this sermon look good, but I do need you. For us to accomplish God's purposes in this world, we need everybody to be on board. We can't afford to have a me church. We have to be a we church. The second partnership that is not so obvious uh, in the passage that we just read is found in verse 2. Notice in verse 2, it says, A man who was lame from birth was being carried. Passive voice. Was being carried. That means he didn't carry himself. That means he must have some friends who actually carried him to be at that gate to beg. Um, Presumably, I I imagine that those people would be his friends. Otherwise, who would carry a, a crippled man? And not just once a week, not just once a month. Notice, he was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. <laughs> every day. This crippled person has friends who probably say to him, hey, mate, let's go to church. You know, we're going to take you. We're not going to take you to the crack house or the whore house. We're going to take you to God's house. And that's where the miracle will happen. Can you imagine? Imagine with me. If on that day, the friends of, those, uh, the friends of that crippled person say, eh, we're pretty tired today. I think we're just going to have a day off. We're not going to take you to the temple gate today. Uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. We'll see how we go. What would happen? Miracle would not have occurred, correct? See, in order for God's miracle to happen, we need to partner with one another. Just like Peter needed John and John needed Peter, Peter and John needed those men to carry that crippled person to the temple gate so that God can do what he does best, and that is perform miracle and change lives. So, if you're not a Christian here today, and you have a friend who always bugs you to come to church, and that's why you are at church today, I want you to thank God for them, all right? Because they are God's divine connection for you. God wants to communicate to you. God wants to talk to you. And instead of being resentful toward them, I want you to thank them because God wants to do something in your life. I believe so, all right? And if, you're not, if you are a Christian, let me tell you, I want you, I want you to ask a question. Who is the crippled person in your life that you can bring to church. Maybe you're saying, I'm not Peter, I'm not John, you know, I'm not good with this uh, miracle stuff. I'm not good with, with talking like Peter. Hey, but can you invite someone? Those friends of that crippled person, maybe they said the same thing. Hey, we, we can't do anything. We can't, we're not good with talking. We, we can't do miracle. But hey, at least we can take you to church, right? It's a partnership, church. It is not just a per- one person's job. We needed each other for God's miracle to happen. We, church, relies heavily on each other, on partnership. When we become a we church that helps each other, God will do His best work. Miracle happens. Let's continue to read the story in verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver or gold? Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Notice, God never asks you to give something that you don't have. God only asks you, what is it that is in your hand? And the beginning point of any miracle is always what you have with you. God never asks you for what you don't have. He only asks you for what you do have. And God can turn what you have into a miracle. Verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Okay? That's the first observation. Second observation, we church pays the price. 
we church pays the price. Guess what happened to Peter after he cured that man from his, uh, you know, crippleness? What happened to Peter? He got thrown in jail. Guess who went with him? John <laughs> went with Peter. Uh, salvation is free. Church, we know that. It's by God's grace alone. You can't work your way to heaven. Because of our sins, you know, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. Salvation is only the free gift of God for us. That's why we call it grace. We don't deserve it. You know, you can't work for it. You don't deserve it. You can't pay for it. Salvation is free. Healing is free. But guess what? Obedience has its cost. Change, all right? Growth has its price. Peter and John paid the price. They got thrown in jail. They got beaten. They got lashes on their back. When they got released, instead of asking God for protection, asking God to deliver them from all the trouble and the pain, they prayed and asked God, God, Give us boldness to preach your word. Give us boldness to preach your word. They know that a we church pays its price. You got to pay your price. Paul paid his price. He too got thrown in jail. And finally, he was executed by the Romans. All the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, apart from John, died a martyr. They all died young, not warm in their bed, in their old age. Why? Because they knew, every single one of them, they knew that for the church to expand, for the kingdom of God to expand, for God's purposes to be accomplished in this world, we have to pay the price. Um, you need to make that decision too. You need to make the decision. You need to ask yourself this question. Is the progress you desire worth the price that you have to pay? Is the progress that you desire worth the price that you have to pay? We have a professional bodybuilder here, Rohan. Uh, I'm sure if you ask him, he would love to have you know, some chocolate cake in the, in the middle of the night when he's hungry and all that. But man, you know, if you want progress question that you have to ask is, is the progress you desire worth the price that you have to pay? Lately, I love eating ducks, you know, and as you can tell, you know, again, I need to make that decision myself, right? Which is more worth it, the duck or spare tire on my tummy? And the answer obviously is the duck, yeah, that's right. In my case, in my case. <laughs> as a church, we need to ask this question as well. Is the progress that we desire as a church worth the price that we have to pay as a church? You know, when we move to that place, to that new place, there will be some changes that need to be made. We need to be more welcoming to people. We need to sacrifice even more. That building still hasn't been paid for. You know, we still need to pay for that building. We have a huge mortgage to pay right now. You know, there are a lot of things that we need to change in order for progress to happen in our church. But if the apostles were willing to pay that price, if the disciples of Jesus, the first church fathers were willing to pay that price, we as a church, we should be willing to pay that price as well. You know why? Because our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, first, were willing, He was willing to pay the price for you and for me. When He died on that cross, when He bled and died a criminal death, He did it for you. He did it for me. He was willing to pay the price. The question is, are you willing to pay the price as well? And finally, observation number three, we church knows there's a greater purpose. We church knows that there is a greater purpose more than just our own little world. You know, I know you care about your family. I know you care about your business. I know you care about your children. And I'm telling you, I'm not ashamed to say this again and again. God cares about 
all of those things as well. God cares about your business. God cares about your family. God cares about your children. But let me tell you, don't get too excited. Yes, God cares about all those things. But God has a larger purpose for you than just you and your own little world. You know, um, sometimes I got frustrated with uh, Google Calendar. You know, I have my computer. I work a lot with my computer and my mobile phone. And, you know, you have this uh, syncing thing now going on with the cloud and everything. So if you put something on your calendar from your computer, it should appear. It should sync to your calendar on your mobile phone. But sometimes it doesn't always happen. But let me tell you, God has the best syncing app in the world. Can we go back to verse 1? As Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 p.m. Notice, you know, Luke, the writer of this book, wrote the exact time when that happened. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 p.m. At that exact time, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Now, you can call it coincidence, but I don't think so. Because God always has a purpose. There's a reason why that happened. In fact, the healing of the crippled man, that's not even the larger purpose. God has an even larger purpose than that. You know what happened after this incident? We didn't read the story because we ended with verse 10. But when you go home, you open your Bible, you read what happens in verse 11 onwards. What happened was, because that crippled man was healed, everyone was amazed. They were all asking questions. Peter used that opportunity to preach the gospel, and 2,000 men got saved. 2,000 men. That's about 4,000 or 5,000 people altogether, if you count the women and children. Because of that one crippled man who got healed, the whole city almost got saved. They got to hear the message of the gospel. Can you imagine that? That's why, remember in the first week we said, when John, when Peter asked Jesus, Jesus, can we stay on this mountaintop experience? You know, this is so good. I'm going to set up a tent for you, for Elijah, for Moses. Jesus said, you can't stay here, Peter. Why? Because God has a larger purpose for you. God has a larger purpose for you. I don't want to tell you the same thing today. God has a larger, larger purpose for you than just your own little world. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Um, imagine. Imagine with me, if as a church, we all recognize this, that hey, you know, it's not just enough for me to set up my retirement plan. <laughs> it's not enough for me to just, you know, making sure that my business does well or my children uh, has, has a good education. But God has a greater purpose for me. I need to understand that. Imagine with me, if every single person who calls this church home understand this, and every one of you say, I'm not going to be happy just to be comfortable in my own little world. I'm not going to be happy just to see my business flourish. You know what brings the most joy to a follower of Christ? What do you think would bring the most joy to a follower of Christ? What brings the most joy is when you see people that you love, when you see people who are dying in their sins, got their lives turned around because of you, because of your sacrifice, because of your giving, because of your service to the church of God, to the kingdom of God. Nothing, let me tell you church, nothing will bring you more joy than seeing someone else come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. For a Christian, nothing will be more joy. You have to understand, God has that purpose for you. Otherwise, He would have taken you home right now because we can do everything that we do here so much better in heaven. But God is not finished with you yet. One of our own is Shirley Chi. She's a nurse in Jundalup. You know, sometimes she took a taxi to come and worship God with us here. You know, pay $60, $80 taxi fare just to be able to worship with God, uh, with us here. And Shirley always uh, tells her patient when, when they say, oh, I just want to die. She said, God is not finished with you yet, ma'am. <laughs> God is not finished with you yet, sir. It's true. God is not finished with you yet. God has a larger purpose for you. That's why in this series, uh, remember two weeks ago, I issued you a 40-day challenge. I just want to remind you of those uh, four challenges that we set out for you. Number one, 
I want you to be at church for the next three weeks now because this is the third week. We've got three weeks to go. I want you to read one verse a day for the next 40 days. We're going to do that as a church together. We're going to let God to speak to us and change us and expand our heart. And we're going to pray and fast for 40 days. And um, I just talked to Pastor Mike this Thursday, if you want to. We're going to cancel music practice. You can come to 31A Manning Road in Kennington, and we're going to pray together as a church. Thursday, 6.30 at 31A Manning Road. We're going to pray together as a church. And then finally, I want all of us to be engaged in some kind of community activities. And we organize one for you. You can organize your own if you want, but we have organized one for you. We call it Love Out Loud, where we're going to go to uh, the train station in Cannington. We're going to go to the bus stops in Cannington, and we're going to distribute water. We're going to distribute water. So if you want, as individual, maybe as a link together, after this worship experience, go toward the exit. There's a table, there's a signage there. You can sign up and choose the date that you want to come. It's going to be a small group of three or four uh, for each station. And you can, only, you can just do it for just one hour. You don't even need to spend a few hours. Just one hour or half an hour, whatever you can spend. Join us and we're just going to bless our community together. And not only that, but we're going to learn as well to expand our heart, to have compassion for people as we distribute this water to them. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Love out loud. So it's going to be exciting. All right? So come back next week and continue to be prayerful. Continue to pray for us. And I'm telling you, if every single one of us do what we're supposed to do, we will not be a me church. We will be a we church. And we're going to see life change happening in our church. Miracle after miracle will happen in this church. I sense that the Spirit of God is in this place right now. And, and God is reaching out to you right now as his servant I want to issue you this challenge today if you're not a Christian God wants to let you know right now more than anything God wants to tell you that he loves you that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you so that the sins that separate you from your creator God your heavenly father will not be a problem anymore because Jesus paid it all he paid it all at the cross so that you could have a relationship with God your heavenly father all you need to do is just to believe him the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son whoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting I want to pray for you. And if you are saying right now, Daniel, I, I need you to pray for me. I want to place my faith in Jesus. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand everything. But I know one thing. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. And I know I need to have my sins forgiven. And I want to believe in Jesus. You know, the Bible says, even though your faith may be as small as a mustard seed, it's a very powerful thing. It's not the size of the faith that matters. It is the object of your faith that matters. If you placed it in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, God promised you eternal life will be yours. So I want to pray for you. And if you want to be included in that prayer, I want you to pray with me out loud. This is your business with God. It's not your business with me or with the church, but this is between you and your God. I want you to repeat after me this prayer. If you want to have your relationship with your Heavenly Father restored forever and ever, you want to spend eternal life with God, all you need to do is just believe Him. I want you to say this prayer with me out loud. I want all the Christians to say this prayer out loud with me as well as we support our new brothers and sisters in Christ. Repeat after me. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. 
I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. I believe that I have been completely forgiven because Jesus paid it all. Now I'm free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I will spend eternity with you in heaven. Not because I'm good. Because I've been, because I've been forgiven. Thank you for saving me. Help me to follow you all the days of my life and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Bible says, if just one person prays that prayer, heaven is rejoicing right now. So why don't we just clap our hands for those who pray that prayer for the first time. And, and I want you to stand on your feet right now. And the second challenge I want to give is to all the Christians, to all the Christ followers, we can't be a me church. If we want to see God's purposes to be accomplished in our life, we have to be a we church. Let's open our hands. Father, you see these open hands right now. Lord, we don't want to be happy just in our own little world. Lord, expand our heart, we pray. Stretch us, we pray. Expand us, Lord, so that we will be a we church in this place. I pray there will not be a selfish Christian among us. I pray that every single person will look out for each other. Always be on the lookout how we can bless one another. How we can serve one another. And I pray, Father, that as a church, we won't just exist for ourselves. This is not a club. I pray that our church will be a blessing where you have placed us. Thank you, God. We believe that the future of this church is bright. Not because we are so talented, not because we are so good, but because your grace is upon this church. Because you want to accomplish your purposes through this church. Thank you, Lord. Help every individual, Lord, with their family, with their businesses. I pray for those who are sick in the name of Jesus that you heal them. Lord, there's healing in your name. I pray for restoration of relationship. I pray for restoration of finance. Everything that we need, you will provide because you're the God who provides. But Lord, help us to see beyond what we need. Help us to see the needs of others around us. Thank you, God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us always from this moment on until Christ Jesus comes again, even forevermore. And all God's people who are blessed, stay together with me. Amen. 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 God bless you, everybody. Don't go home right away. Join us for coffee at the back. Have a wonderful week. God bless.